Well, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this pre-concert talk ahead of our performances of Haydn's masterful The Creation, a piece that True Concord performed, I can't believe this, 13, no, 14 years ago was the last time. Where did those 14 years go? It's been way too long. And at the same time, wow, it was went really quickly. Uh, but here we are again with a piece that deserves to be heard time and time again, this incredible piece by, by Haydn. And I'm pleased to have today with me, Phil Moody, our assistant director of True Concord. Thanks for being here, Phil. Of course, thanks. It's great to talk about Haydn. As we all know, we love it. Great piece. It, it is a great piece. And just so everybody knows, because I am still just in awe of this whole technological thing. I'm sitting here in my living room in Tucson, and you are in Atlanta on, on my couch. One of the few oh. times I get to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, because you're always traveling around. But isn't it cool that we can talk to each other like this and uh, put it together in a, in, a, in a little chat and everybody can, can watch it? Yeah, it's wonderful. Love technology. <laughs> You know, I'm liking it more and more. I'm not very good at it, but thanks to you, and I know this isn't in your job description, Phil, but you've helped me many a time with technological issues along the way. Always happy to help. It's the end product, you know, as long as the product is good, however we make it happen, that's how we do it. All other duties as assigned, right? That's right. Okay, well, uh, so glad you're here, Phil, and thank you to all of you for joining us for this talk. Um, I, I don't know about you, Phil, but I'm still riding high from uh, these performances we just had of Jocelyn Hagen's Here I Am. Um, <laughs> that was, um, you know, when, when you get a new piece, and I love commissioning new works, there's always the you never know what you're going to get. Yep. And even when you get the score, you're looking over the score, you're still not sure what you got. <laughs> and then you get the group together and the choir sings it and the orchestra plays and you're like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then you get into performance and you go, wow, this was actually pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, just based on the feedback we got from audiences and, and artists alike, it was it was just a really a, a moving experience and a really great piece. It was incredible. I mean, I, the, the message, you know, I mean, and yeah. just even, I mean, it's for me, you know, being able to realize more of the struggles that are still here, you know, constantly oh, yeah. from and that I didn't think about either. It was, yeah, yeah it was amazing. Just amazing. Yeah. And, and Jocelyn, you know, we got to put wine glasses into trash cans. So, <laughs> Yes, we did. Five measures that I'll never forget. Throwing wine glasses into a garbage can. Uh, finding the right glasses, finding the right garbage cans. Yes. I, I love the effect and I love what it stood for, the breaking of the glass ceiling, um, yep. which uh, women did 100 years ago with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but they're still breaking glass and there's a lot of glass yet to be broken going ahead. Yep. So uh, moving on from that new classic to this timeless classic that we're about to perform again, Haydn's Masterpiece. Um, I, 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 want to, I want to get into the, the nuts and bolts of this piece a little bit um, with you, Phil, because you've got a, a pretty special and deep connection to this work. Um, but I also want people just to, to know a little bit more about you and, and how you got into this role and um, you know, what you're doing in Atlanta and what you're doing around the country. So, you know, give, give our audiences who've seen you on stage, you know, doing some conducting, but also, you know, getting things set up and doing all manner of things. You know, just tell us how you got to this point. And every once in a while, you know, singing too, if you know. <laughs> oh, you want, once in a while you <laughs> do that too. Just, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, um, gosh, I mean, I mean, obviously music's always kind of been part of my life and uh, it was a high school choir director that, you know, said to me, it's a really shame you're not going to music. And of course I said, well, but I mean, I have to have a job. <laughs> and of course he's like, well, I mean, I'm your choir director. Like, that's my job. I'm getting paid. And it was all of a sudden, oh, 
you're right. I don't have to go into engineering or something else. You know, like I could actually just do what I love. And where was this, Phil? You grew up in Springfield, Missouri. Missouri, or yeah. is it Missouri? So, uh, Missouri oh yeah, Missouri. Well, I mean, you know, Missouri, but many people in the state do think there's an AH at the end of the word. Mm -hmm. So you know, what Missouri can you do? You? <laughs> yeah, tomato, tomato, huh? That's right. But uh, yeah, no, so. You know, it was, it was good growing up, um, and then, but I, like, junior year then of my high school was, okay, I need to go find places to do music instead, so that, uh, in the end, uh, put me to St. Wolf College, uh, and so that's kind of, there was my Lutheran connection, of course, uh, and just real amazing choral music. Uh, while I was there, uh, I was one of the founders of Contus, um, that we all, you know, know, and of course now, which, oh my God, plenty of there's fellow colleagues that I could sing with all the time now at True Concord, you know, because there's, it seems like always four or five <laughs> of us that used to be there now and are here. So, well, that's, that's right. I mean, um, we, <laughs> it's funny because we collaborated with Contus in a concert. You remember this back in oh, yeah. know, 2015, maybe, I think. Um, maybe 2016, somewhere in there, we shared the stage with them. They they did a set, we did a set, and then we did some pieces together. And then from that point on, several of those guys have have wound up in the in True Concord Choir. And I, and when we recorded the Christmas album, there was either four or five of the Contus guys that were on that album. Yep, yep. And we have well, and uh, there was another recording. Uh, or no, you're right. It was the Christmas one. Um, and we actually. I'm, you know, I'm trying to find it somewhere. We even took a picture because we had like yes. Paul Rudoy, you know, and and all the way up to the me and Tim. So we oh, you did it like, according you know, to height. The Verizon, cell, yeah, cell tower. Oh, that's good. We've got we, we've got five bars. Yep, yeah. <laughs> that's good. So, but yeah, I mean, it was you know a great, I mean, great experience, of course. Um, and then you know, it's I've I've kind of I've always went back and forth between the singing and the conducting, you know, um, I mean, I kind of, I've always liked both of them. Um, I, you know, I definitely love to sing when I, uh, when I'm able to, and, you know, with great works and, you know, great musicians. Um, and the conducting side of it for me, I always, I always felt privileged that, especially being a vocalist, being able to be someone that could know and understand kind of maybe what, what they wanted and really be that collaborator, you know, and that, as a conductor, it's not about us, you know, it's not about that person on the podium just waving a stick, but it's yeah. about the collaboration and the assistance we as conductors can get to give to those musicians. So yeah. we create that experience for everybody, you know, so both of those have always just been wonderful to me. Um, so after that was University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, and that was where creation started as well, which well, we'll get back to it in a minute. Um, uh, but uh, Brad Ellenbo, great, uh, just great mentor as well, did conducting and uh, performance with him. Uh, then it was Houston and Houston Grand Opera for a little bit with Richard Beto and nice. uh, big the opera course there. Um, and that really is what pushed me into more of some of the opera um, and orchestral conducting as well. So I spent some time there. Um, and then as we all know, choral music and well, I need to get that doctorate. So where do we where do we see where would go? one go to get a doctorate in conducting choral conducting so there was university of arizona and you know 2009 to 12 and at that point is when then also i met you and then started singing with true concord and yeah so and you and, and assistant director wise yeah uh, so this has been this is the fourth or the this is your fourth year, year? okay Time for, flies. I think it is the fourth year. Yeah. Um, you know, so we've went through bubbles and everything else. We have. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of that, you know, every hat that maybe needs to be worn uh, at different times to make sure things work, you know, getting a between a charger for your iPhone uh, to this is how we find the Google Drive, you know, to, okay, uh, let's make sure that we've got the right chairs and stands and, you know, yeah. all those things are ready. Um, and then, you know, as, as you've mentioned too, getting to do some wonderful music making, you know, yeah. and some great conducting, which I just always love with all these people. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a great role, uh, that, you know, as we both know is still evolving and 
I'm, I'm loving the, I'm loving the additional work with True Concord and just really, you know, being a great part of this wonderful organization. So. Yeah, and it's, it's good having you on the team, Phil. And, you know, just going back to the U of A, one thing that's really special about the U of A conducting program under Bruce Chamberlain, now, now retired, was his emphasis and his expertise with the, with the choral orchestral masterworks. And I, you know, I, for one, and I'm sure you did too, just learned a ton in, in how you approach these pieces, working with, you know, the, the combined choirs and orchestras um, to pull them off and, and, and really understand and appreciate the historical context and the composer's intentions with it. I mean, I can't imagine a better experience uh, than, than doing that with Dr. Chamberlain at, at the U of A. And, and we, we both yeah. got to have that. Experience, which leads us to one of the one of the great works in, in that canon, and that's that's the creation, um, which was a central part of your um, your project and a very 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 specific aspect of it, which we'll we'll get to in a sec. But let's let's talk about the work itself. This is um, comes from the the late eighteenth century, near the end of Haydn's life. Um, you know, when we think of Haydn, when I think of Haydn, I think of string quartets and 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 I think of symphonies. You yep. know, got about a hundred symphonies, um, but he's got these really terrific choral masterpieces. I think of the 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 late great masses. Um, you know, we we just did. Well, we've actually done a couple of his masses in the last few years. One in the bubble, um, mm -hmm. and in and, and one last season. Um, but you know, this this work falls in that that genre of, of oratorio and um you know Haydn apparently was inspired in his trips to England we know about his visits to England but it was inspired by these oratorios of Handel and you know when we think of Handel and oratorios you know obviously we think of Messiah but he's just got a whole bunch of these works um a lot of which come from use texts from the Bible and tell these dramatic and interesting stories about these biblical characters. Um, and, and Haydn apparently uh, saw some of these and, and thought, hey, I want to try my hand at that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and it was a visit to England where then he gets this wonderful libretto of the creation. So. Right. <laughs> so, and, and, and the libretto is an interesting, interesting story. Um, and this is where we're starting to get closer to 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 your uh, your particular area of study. But you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, because you're the expert now. But um, it's it's like so we get this libretto in English, and then Haydn brings it back, and he has Baron von Sweeten translated into German. Yep. And then Haydn sets the German text to music. But hey, there's still this English speaking audience that wants to enjoy this work. So we also need an English uh, version of this music that was written to accommodate German texts. Yep. And then herein lies the big issue. It's like music that was written to accommodate German, but wanting to create a, 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 a text for, for English words. And tell us about that, that all the, 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 the issues around that. Well, and you're right. It, you know, the at, at that time period, I mean, you you there were translations all the time for oratorios. You know, I mean, it, when it went to another country, I mean, the tradition at that point was if somebody wanted it in that native language, somebody would just change things there. You know, um, so the what we think of then, especially as, but this is the regular language, and then this is the translation that is official for you know, this piece, you know, like, I think it's like, like Elijah, you know, it's like that, where we've got all these official, here's the official translation, this is how it works. Um, that wasn't the case at that point, you know, I mean, in a lot of my research, I mean, you can, this, this creation that was, well, it was translated in probably every language you could think of, it was that popular, you know, um, but, but the big reason that we have this issue here was Hyde insisted that he publish a bilingual score. Okay. So this was the first time, and it was 1800 exactly. This was the first time that you actually had a published score that had two languages in it instead oh, of cool. just the German. So, but of course, like you said, that there lies the problem because it was this English libretto 
that was, you know, there's, of course, things from the Bible. Uh, there's a lot of things from Milton's Paradise Lost as well. But Baron von Sweeten translates it into German because Haydn doesn't feel comfortable with the English language enough to actually write the piece. Uh, but when von Sweeten translates it, he really makes his own libretto. He adds German adjectives and other things that aren't part of that original English. So that's why we can't just have that English libretto that was already there and that gets plugged in. Von Sweeten then has to actually retranslate it into English. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> English, so, German, back to English. You've got this German libretto that is amazing. And then, you know, then this, this German that English is definitely a second language. And he's not, you know, he's not a translator. I mean, that, that's not, you know, his wheelhouse in, in many respects. I mean, he's good at it, but it's definitely not, you know, his profession. Um, so you get all those issues, you know. And, um, and then on top of that, when he, of course, when you do translations, you're never going to get the exact same syllables. We, we know this kind of thing, you know. And especially with music, that's extremely important. We've got yeah. so many notes. And we need so many syllables. Yes. And hopefully we have the right emphasis on the right syllable in that new sentence as well, you know? Right, right. Um, so that just, you know, it opens up a slew of problems, um, you know, and, and then on top of all that, add to it that Haydn didn't really want to oversee that portion of it and really let von Sweet just put in the English. Oh, that's so if, interesting. If he had, you know, one more syllable, well, he just took a half note and made it into, you know, two quarter notes. Boop, problem solved. <laughs> so he's actually really. changing, he's changing the music. Yeah. He ended yep. up so, so Von Sweden ended up changing Haydn's music. Yep. Wow. That's, so there you go. <laughs> that, that's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, and many of our audience uh, have participated in choirs, uh, you know, practically all their lives and have sung major works. And I would imagine a number of people have sung this piece. I've sung it, um, you know, the translation that comes to my mind is, you know, Robert Shaw and, and, and you know, he, he spent some time at it. Why did you, Phil, think with all these translations out there, why did you think you needed to tackle this and, and ultimately create your own? It's a great question. Um, you know, and, and the first thing I would say is, you know, it was, of course, it was a love for the piece, you know, mm -hmm. and a love for the delivery, you know, as we'll probably talk a little bit later, too. I mean, just the way the way Haydn uses the orchestra and paints everything, you know, and the word painting. And especially because I've always loved opera and musical theater as well, you know, the not only having an English translation, but having something that makes sense to the audience there. And that was where because you're right, the Robert Shaw, there is some great stuff with that translation. Um, but there's a lot of it that, you know, it was, it made sense in the 60s and 70s. And some of that language still today now doesn't maybe make as much sense, you know, or words, verd or clad and things like that, that still are more historic or, you know, just words you think that the normal audience, you know, I don't want to come to a concert and bring my dictionary or thesaurus, you know, so... <laughs> That that was really what prompted me to say, you know what, I think that there is is a need for another one that's a little fresher, um, that again, is not the end all be all, you know, by all means, but it's another option that I think is more current than some of them that had happened. That's really cool. So, so to be absolutely clear, so you, you come to the U of A, and you you're, you're doing your coursework and like like all of us who go through this dma program you got to come up with the topic you're like you know i love this piece i want to do something about it i feel like there's a need yep and you create this new edition yep. and you publish it and this this constitutes basically your your final project your dissertation you write a, you write a paper about it and you actually produce a a, a brand new performing edition of this work that that people are using now and yep. including concord in this upcoming concert yeah uh and that was you know i and you know going back again to talk about university of mexico that was actually the first time i tackled this project um was for the master's thesis there in 2000 with brad um but as we all know you know a master's thesis and a doctoral <laughs> research document are 
two far cries from each other, you know. Um, and, you know, and it, it, with the Masters, I didn't do, there definitely was not as much, you know, real background research, especially with texts of really where are all the origins and what is the best idea, you know. And with the doctrine, of course, you've got to lay down your guidelines of yep. what you're, you know, doing. So, I mean, so there was, as, as I mentioned, you know, you've got different changes with, you know, notes or um, where inflections happen. So the, my whole, my whole thing then at the University of Arizona was to look at that original and to never change any notes in the original German, um, to always still use as much of the original English that made sense. Um, also to look at the actual German. And I spent time with a German professor at University of Arizona and we went through and did word for word translations of every German um, word to make sure that then that was the same as what von Sweeten did. Um, and, you know, and even there, you know, I remember many times where it'd be, wow, that's a really archaic German word. Uh, give me a day and let me figure out where that comes from and then we can figure out that. Um, so, so there were some things like that, that, you know, we, I made sure that then it really was true because as we know, Haydn, it was the German that he read and it was the German that inspired him to make the music. So yeah. that should be your only basis and that should never yeah. be changed. Yeah. That, that, that sounds like a really logical process. And, um, and you produced this, this new, you know, this new edition and unlike a lot of people who write a dissertation, myself included, we write this big paper and then it ends up sitting on a shelf somewhere and collecting dust. Yours is actually being out there and, and benefiting the, the world in a, in a real practical way. So who's, who's performed your, your edition? Uh, so I, I was just with Richmond Symphony this last April. It was part of their nice. uh, anniversary. Uh, it was you know great, great performance. Uh, loved it. We've got True Concord. Um, there's a there's a community group in Scotland right now that's going nice. to do. Um, actually, they're doing my reduced orchestration as well of it, which whole different topic. And we're not doing that here with True Concord, but um, you know again to make it accessible. You know, also looked at that orchestration. So that's part of the published. Um, so that's happening. Uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues, you know, just ask, can I get that score? So then, you know, they start to do it here, there, and hey, by the way, here's this other translation. Let's, you know, look at it. So um, I'll, we'll be doing it next summer with the Des Moines Choral Festival. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely getting out there. Um, it's, even with Richmond Symphony, Erin Freeman, she was just searching because she was going to do her own, and then thought, well, you know, I should probably find some resources, and started looking around and saw this and was like, well, great, it's already done. Like, and, you know, started looking at it, it was like, yep, yep, okay. Why should I spend time? Thanks. Right. So it's, it is, you know, it is getting out there. And uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's great, you know, positive vibes of thank you, you know, thanks for, again, bringing this now back into, you know, English audiences without a thesaurus. <laughs> That, that's really cool, Phil. Congratulations. And we're really excited to, to perform this piece with your new words. And I just want to be clear, this is, this is Haydn's music. I mean, this is, you know, um, people are going to come and hear what they would expect to hear with this incredible orchestration and brilliant setting of, of, of text and bring to life uh, many of the, the meanings of these words. Um, it's just you've freshened up the language. Yep. So let, let's talk about um, the structure of this piece and, and what are some of the highlights of it. It's uh, the piece is in three parts, right? Can you, can you talk about the, the three different parts? Yeah, so uh, the first two are, of course, then the six days of creation. Um, he, you know, basically heightened structure for this piece and it's brilliant is there's pretty much always some kind of a recitative that's been in the first and second parts, our three soloists are um, angels. So we've got Gabriel, who's the soprano, Uriel, who's the tenor, and Raphael, who's the bass. And let's talk about our soloists in this case, which are yes. Chelsea Helm, and Uriel is played by Stephen Sof, yep. and Raphael is played by Max uh, Tipton. Yep, yeah, amazing. I mean, cannot wait, cannot wait to hear yeah. everything from them, just beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, but so they basically, there's always kind of a recitative that they have, and that's all the text that comes directly from Genesis. So that's the, and you know, God, and then we had water and we had, you know, the firmament that then gave us heaven and earth, um, yep. or then, you know, the rivers and the mountains and 
the sun and the stars, everything. Um, then he, there's always, well, I, yeah, I think always uh, is followed then by some kind of an aria. And it's always that same angel. And that's where, from the original text, that's where Milton's Paradise Lost comes in. Uh -huh. Because then this is where we get all this awesome descriptive language of yeah. things from Paradise Lost. Um, so then, and then after that, you get a chorus, and that's always been the kind of reflection and praise of look at what God's done yeah. in this day. It's amazing. So we basically get that structure for each day, day one, two, three, four, five, and six, and that takes care of all of creation, you know, in all of its various elements. Um, and the way he uh, creates the structure in terms of part one and two, we get the first four days, for whatever reason, they're, each one of those are a little shorter. And by the time we get to day five, there's a few more recits or a few more arias before we finish up with that day. Um, so then part two is day five and six. Um, and then part three, uh, Gabriel and Raphael leave. So that's the soprano and bass. Um, Uriel, the tenor, Steve Soth, still stays so he can kind of narrate then the scene. But now we go to the Garden of Eden. Nice. So the soprano, um, and then it's Julie Bosworth. Uh, she then becomes uh, Eve, and then the bass, and that's Ned. Uh, Edward Vogel. Edward, thank you. I always, I always forget his last name. Um, so, and he becomes Adam. So now we just get this great picturesque scene of we're in the garden and isn't this wonderful and, you know, let's spend our lives together and, again, let's praise God for everything that's happened. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it is obviously the biblical story of creation. Um, and one thing, I, one thing I really love about the piece, um, as we had said, I mean, it's a great masterwork. You know, Haydn is just brilliant with the way he paints all this stuff, you know. But whatever your fundamental belief is, this piece is just, I mean, at, at the real basis, it's an observation and wonderment of just what Earth is. You yeah. know, and all the beauty that's here, you know, whatever your belief in terms of how it came about, you can celebrate what a planet we have, you know? <laughs> no, that's, that, is, that is a good point. And for some people, this will be a very religious experience with, around these texts. And, and for others, it's just going to be an awe, again, of uh, help us to be reminded of the awe of the creation, you know, our, our beautiful planet. And, and for others yet, it will be just awe of this masterpiece. Um, yeah. Arguably, um, Haydn's greatest masterpiece. I put it up there with Handel's Messiah and Mendelssohn's Elijah with three of the most important oratorios and most performed oratorios in the world. So this is a... This is a, a piece that comes around, in this case, every 14 years or so. I can't believe Which it. Maybe I could get you to shorten that up next time. I know, right? Um, so th you, this is something you don't want to miss. It's it's like when the St. Matthew Passion comes around or uh, or you know, the Bach B minor Mass. It, 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 it's like a great uh, art collection that has come to your town for a for a short time you, you really have to go see it um and experience it and so uh i i hope that everyone will will take the opportunity to to experience this great music i will be conducting part one and part two and phil i'm delighted that you will then take the baton and and conduct uh part three so it'll be a, a real team effort yeah it's gonna be wonderful so i i can't wait i like you, know, like you said, I really hope we get to see all of you there. Um, it really is a monumental work. You know, it's, it, it, yeah, it's just been done so much, um, rightfully so, you know. Um, done so much and yet rarely heard in these parts. I mean, because probably the last time it was heard in Arizona, or at least in Tucson, was probably 14 years ago. Well, I'm glad we get to bring it back, you know? Uh, me too, me too. So so tickets are available uh, by going on online, www.trueconcord.org or calling our office at 520-401-2651. We mentioned Edward, who will be playing the role of Adam in part three. 
Um, we're going to focus on Edward in a recital uh, of works by British composers coming up in March. And that's going to be at the Hacienda del Sol, the beautiful inner courtyard under the stars. It's an English program. Everybody should grab a gin and tonic or whatever your uh, libation of choice is and enjoy uh, Ned as he's known. But first we get to experience him as Adam in creation. And then I need to mention Emily Marvish, who's one of our frequent soloists. She will be singing in the chorus uh, with the uh, for the Haydn Creation performances. She will be giving a, uh, a program, a delightful program at the incredibly refurbished Century Room at Hotel Congress. And this is the Tuesday after the creation performances. There again, grab a drink and enjoy a fun program, including some, some pieces by Jocelyn Hagen, some Rachmaninoff. Um, she's going she's gonna to explore the, the, the kind of fun stories behind Hotel Congress. So a, a lot of really interesting and fun and exciting programming coming up here as we're finishing this 19th season. Hard to believe we're coming up on our 20th and we're going to be rolling out big plans for the 20th uh, here soon. But in the meantime, come here, Haydn Creation, come experience it. Phil, thank you so much for in enlightening us about this great piece and your process and major contribution to it uh, and to the world of music. So, so thank you very much. And um, great talking with you, Phil. You too. I always love, I, you know, like we said, I gotta, you gotta love Masterworks. I love talking about it. So it's yep. been a great time. Can't wait to see everybody. All right. And thanks everybody. We'll see you soon.